Since the day he was created, Brock Lesnar has conquered every obstacle in his path of destruction with the fury of an F5, possessing the type of staggering strength, speed, and agility typically reserved for mutants. Brock went on to claim numerous championships, take multiple opponents to Suplex City, and put an end to The Undertaker's historic, undefeated WrestleMania streak. Musically speaking, Brock's themes have been few and far between, with notably one song in particular which in many ways has been the only theme the Beast has ever needed. Personally, if I ever got an official theme, I'd rig my doors to play it every time I walked into or out of my house. But enough about me. This documentary will also chronicle Lesnar's wrestling career. So join us now as we take a special look behind the themes of Brock Lesnar. As a 6 foot 3, 270 pound genetic anomaly freak of nature, Brock Lesnar has always had a natural athletic pedigree that helped him to have an outstanding amateur wrestling career, which included becoming the NCAA Division I heavyweight champion as a senior at the University of Minnesota. Good old JR, the head of WWE's talent relations at the time, took notice of the young Lesnar as he smashed his way through the college wrestling ranks, and upon graduation, Brock signed on with the E to begin work as a professional wrestler. Immediately assigned to the promotion's then developmental territory, Ohio Valley Wrestling, to begin his training, Brock was paired up with fellow Golden Gopher and college roomie Sheldon Benjamin, and they became known as the Minnesota Stretching Crew. A badass name if there ever was one. Now if you can't get Limp Biscuits, brain-rattling rap epic, take a look around out of your head, you aren't the only one. The hard-rocking tune for the Tom Cruise blockbuster Mission Impossible 2 was Brock's first entrance theme and might just be the Biscuits' best banger to date. With a stellar tone and a slow burning intro that featured a sick opening guitar riff, the blend of Fred Durst's clever hip hop lyrics and the band's tight togetherness was on point here. And after two years in OVW, sharpening his wrestling skills among other future superstars like Batista, Randy Orton, and John Cena, the physically gifted Lesnar's mission, should he choose to accept it, was to unleash his athletic prowess upon the WWE and become beyond a shadow of a doubt the next big thing. When Brock made his first televised appearance in the WWF, his awe-inspiring presence immediately made people sit up and take notice. With his advocate, Paul Heyman, by his side, Lesnar debuted on the Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania 18, back when the Raw after Mania meant something. And he single-handedly ragdolled a ring full of unfortunate superstars. From that night on, Brock's domination was unrepentant as he began his reign of terror as the most dangerous specimen in the history of any combat base profession. Here Comes the Pain became an accurate description of one of the WWE's hottest properties, leading to a King of the Ring victory, and in a matter of mere months, Lesnar went on to the main event of SummerSlam and defeated The Rock to become the WWE Undisputed Champion. However, becoming the fastest rising star sports entertainment had ever seen, Brock burned out quickly and opted to leave the company and pursue a professional football career with the Minnesota Vikings. Now to me, his enforcer theme just screams ruthless aggression. Back when everything was a little darker and more demented than today's watered down wrestling shows. It's a shame that Brock used like six different versions of the Enforcer theme for a month before it was replaced. Jim Johnston worked his butt off experimenting with different introduction sounds like clanging steel and jackhammers before finally settling on the opening guitar lick we've all come to know and love. his exit from WWE, the Beast wanted to try his hand at the NFL, and given his freakish athleticism and frightening intensity, who could say no? However, Lesnar wasn't quite as successful on the NFL gridiron as he was inside the squared circle or even the octagon. While he had the strength and build of a football player and performed well during the NFL combine, a nasty motorcycle accident left him with a cracked jaw, bruised pelvis, and a broken left arm. So he wasn't fully recovered while trying to play during the preseason 
season and wound up being cut from the team. With his NFL dream dead and his bridge back to the WWE burned, Brock needed to find a way to make some money. Having signed a non-compete in his original contract with Vince, Lesnar entered into a drawn-out, expensive legal battle with the E and took his talents to New Japan Pro Wrestling, where he won the IWGP Heavyweight Championship on his debut match. The WWE tried their best to stop Brock from competing, but the court dismissed the lawsuits, which allowed Lesnar to continue performing in the land of the rising sun against the likes of Shinsuke Nakamura, Aki Bono, and Giant Bernard. However, Lesnar held the title hostage in America due to a pay dispute and didn't defend it for almost an entire year until he eventually dropped it to Olympic gold medalist and WrestleMania 19 dance partner Kurt Angle. His New Japan theme, Kingdom Comes, is an epic saga of a song that is Final Boss AF and fit not only for a king, but also for a beast incarnate. throughout Brock Lesnar's full-time and part-time WWE runs, it seems that he has only really used this theme, carrying all the frightening energy of the beast's potent, aggressive, and terrorizing demeanor. The next big thing's ominous instrumental thumps make for a big, imposing Terminator-esque theme song fit for a big, imposing Terminator like Brock. And when you hear that initial guitar screech, you know it's about to go down. Now the freight train of momentum of Lesnar didn't stall one bit after a layoff of nearly 10 years. When the Beast returned to the WWE in 2012, he was firing on all cylinders and battling the very best WWE had to offer. John Cena, Triple H, CM Punk, The Big Show, The Undertaker, Kofi Kingston, Sheamus, Rusev, The Wyatt Family, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, Goldberg, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan. You get the picture, I think. For most of his story career, Lesnar has played the role of a mega villain, a mercenary, a cold-blooded beast who fought for money, his own amusement, and the thrill of mauling someone. These points were hammered home into the very consciousness of the WWE universe, pal. But despite this horrific picture that has been painted about Brock, it turns out that he's actually a fun-loving mountain man who just loves to do cowboy shit like hunt and fish on his Canadian farm. And as a matter of fact, Lesnar has always had a particular penchant for dancing on live television. Yes, it sounds ridiculous for Brock Lesnar, of all people, to enjoy cutting a rug and busting a move, but that's exactly what he did during his build-up to the feud with the late great Eddie Guerrero, waltzing down to the ring with a sombrero perched on top of his melon. And many years later, upon winning the Money in the Bank briefcase, Lesnar started a short-lived gimmick as WWE's DJ, carrying the briefcase as a boombox where he displayed a love for all kinds of music as he jammed out to the theme songs of Seth freaking Rollins' and Kofi Kingston. Moreover, Lesnar made it clear that the instrument on his shoulder was no mere boombox, but rather a beast box. WWE's in-house music group Def Rebel threw this little ditty together for the Brock party, and you could tell the big guy approved because he was really getting jiggy with it. Yeah. 